Hi, welcome to Hard Boiled Synthesis, Lecture 25. We are continuing the write-up to the meta-analysis. We are nearing the end of the course. My goal is to have 30 lectures. So yeah, there's still about five left. Oh, it's great to almost be done. <laughs> this has been an unusual endeavor. I mean, I didn't expect it to be so uh, <clears throat> time-consuming, but it is. And, and nonetheless, I push forward and hopefully provide you guys some um, interesting ways to uh, think about research synthesis. Today, I'm going to um, put structure down to my manuscript in terms of what I want to write for the results. The results are perhaps the most straightforward things you're going to write in terms of like um, strong statements. And also because you are limited in what you could say because of the statistics you're reporting, right? The, uh, the outcomes are really going to uh, influence the way you present your results. Um, this is also where you could get into a lot of trouble if you uh, do some funny business in interpreting the outcomes of your stats. Today is not really about that kind of stuff. It's mostly about ideas, how to present things, in a meta-analysis to make it easier to write it up. I wish I could spend a lot of time describing, you know, the proper way to report stats. And I do a little bit of that. We're going to go through a published example and just see how they kind of reported some of these uh, statistics. But my goal is to like uh, try to make progress on the manuscript of catnip repellency against mosquitoes. And so today, no meandering, no willy-nilly stuff. I need to focus and just uh, start putting subheadings, questions, what exactly do I want to address with my meta-analysis. Hopefully when you get to this stage, when you're doing the write-up, you know exactly what you want to talk about. Um, I mean, you've done the meta-analysis, you've devised the contrast, right? You devised effect sizes, everything Every discussion, every point you want to make revolves around your interpretation of those effect sizes and and their um, their aggregate, you know, the grand mean or whatever you call it, and but also uh, whether or not you tested predictors. All that is already kind of described in detail. It should be in the methods. It should have been primed in the intro, and now you're just following through on some of the things you. Um, presented to the reader in terms of hypotheses tested or uh, predictors explored. So let's jump into our Word document here. Um, I got the really super superficial introduction. I got my structure for the methods, which is a giant laundry list of really important things to report. But now you know, I, it's time to start thinking about the results. And, and I like the results section of a meta-analysis to have a very uh, specific type of structure. A strong results section often just starts off with the main finding. Um, but the uh, outcomes of meta-analysis can be diverse. And it's nice to provide a little bit of context of what is being synthesized. And so typically what I like is my first paragraph of the results to be a, um, a summary of the diversity of things that were extracted. You know, the composition of the uh, data used in the analyses, right? So. For example, um, let's just give it a subheading. Composition of studies. This is like a pretend subheading, okay? And then uh, let's throw in some points in here. Composition of studies synthesized. So number of studies um, 
included, right? So you, you went through this entire screening um, retrieval process, how many studies ended up being part of your meta-analysis. I think all this is super nice to have it straight um, up front and, and um, encapsulated in a single paragraph, a nice summary paragraph of, you know, what you would conventionally call like a systematic review outcomes. You're talking about the diversity of stuff, uh, diversity of studies in your, in your uh, synthesis. That's not necessarily any of the quantitative outcomes yet, right? It's just to give you, give the reader some context in like all the stuff you're pulling together or contrasting. So number of studies included, number of effect sizes extracted from those studies, bonus points if you describe information on some of the non-independence non among, among effect sizes, right? So in ecology, it's not super unusual to extract many effects from a single study. That could... Um, impact the over-representation of a single study in your synthesis because this one study reported 40 effects, whereas others reported three or five, right? And it, this ends up being stuff that you model with your meta-analysis. But bonus points, if you describe um, Um, information on the non-independence independ <laughs> it's gonna be rough today yeah uh, non-independence of effect sizes so for example um, you know even though I extracted 500 effect sizes from my for my synthesis um, these were spread out amongst 32 studies, right? There's some language like that to indicate that, holy smokes, you got a lot of effects and you, and at least you've uh, spent some time thinking about issues associated with the over-representation of effects in your synthesis. You know, you medical folks out there, this may not be something you, you deal with because, you know, you typically have just one strong outcome Per study, but ecological studies, you know, we report many, 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 many things in the primary lit, right? You do a community ecology study, you're reporting a whole bunch of effects from different trophic groups, habitats, right? There's like a large diversity of dimensions that are reported and explored, some of which may be relevant to a synthesis project, many of which may be relevant to a synthesis project. You know, we got to model that stuff. Um, I don't really have to deal with that with the um, repellency studies per se. The only forms of non-independence that I experienced was um, studies reporting a repellency among, amongst many species of mosquitoes. Studies reporting a time series. You know, that's un not unusual with repellency studies where you're trying to find like the optimal optimal dose uh, trying to maximize the number of time the repellent is has a positive effects with simultaneously with the optimal dose right um, and so you know if once I actually pull these uh, proper analyses together I will I will model all that stuff it's fairly straightforward at this point to model those um, sources of non-independence. I need to move on. Okay, composition of studies, right? Just description. Um, this may already be reported in your Prisma flowchart. Um, and so this may be an opportunity for you to uh, reference again that chart. But more often enough, the Prisma flowcharts are reported in the methods, but it's important to think of them as it being an outcome of your synthesis too. So, you know, why not re re refer to it again? 
give a reader a second chance to um, put it on the radar of the entire process in which you uh, identified and extracted effect sizes. Table of studies. I, I'm very old fashioned and in terms of like um, giving people credit for the research. You know, I remember when I was a budding research synthesis methodologist, um, a common criticism of a meta-analysis was, you know, you were somewhat of a parasite, parasite researcher because you're feeding off all the outcomes that have been published. Um, and often enough, at least back then, the practice was, you know, you wouldn't even um, give credit to the origin of all those effects. Um, and there, there are many reasons why, for example, pagination issues when your um, um, journals are kind of organizing uh, manuscripts into a publishable uh, unit. You know, they're trying to squeeze in a lot of different things. If you synthesize 200 studies, a giant table may not be something interesting to report, mostly because it has a double effect. You have the table, very long, right? 200 rows of studies. But on top of that, you have X number of lines in the references citing those 200 studies. I like that, right? You got to give credit to the researchers you know, just think about it. I mean, you know, how far could you have taken your synthesis project if those studies did not exist? So at minimum, they should get a reward of like a citation <laughs> or at least a, 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 a more detailed description of the study in the table just so that re reviewers, um, reviewers see the diversity of studies uh, included in your synthesis. So I don't know where I'm going with this. Include a table. If you can't include a table, one other workaround is to have like a have all the studies included in your synthesis reported in the reference section, and then and then they're all uniquely marked with like an asterisk, and then you have like a little subheader next to the reference that says everything with an asterisk was a study included in the meta analysis. It doesn't necessarily mean the study gets cited somewhere in the main text. It just means that, oh, we're giving credit to the source, the origin of the data included in your synthesis. I love tables. Here's an example of a table. Um, right, you get a nice link to the publication and you get uh, information of, of individual studies. Often the things you include in a table are the chunks and bits that you uh, test as moderators or predictors, right? So hypothetically, my table with the uh, catnip propellancy studies, I'm going to have the citation of the study. I'm going to include the species of mosquitoes, of course. I'm going to report the um, type of application of the repellent. Was it an essential oil? Was it an um, isolated compound? Um, type of experiment? arm and cage, Y-tube, whatever, and then other details. Again, this is a uh, context, right? Allowing readers of your synthesis the opportunity to evaluate the diversity of stuff you included in your synthesis. Maybe you forgot a key aspect of experimental design. This is where the reader will be like, oh, they forgot to do this. Maybe the reviewer will catch that and help you out and be nice and say, hey, you forgot this bit. Squeeze it in there. Include a table. Now, a better thing is, you know, if you have many, many studies, like hundreds, you spend all the time formatting a table for it. And then in the end, when the paper gets accepted for publication, you're like, well, maybe you should squeeze that in an appendix. Um, appendices do not often get... Um, scraped or crawled on for citations and references. And so it's great that there's a, like an association in your publication of the studies, um, including in your synthesis, uh, but the authors may not actually get credit downstream because all of that gets dumped in an appendix. I have no advice 
on this stuff other than just do the best you can to try to give credit to, to those authors. Okay. Back to the manuscript here. Okay, so table of studies. This is where, okay, so this section you refer to your table. Here's all the studies I pulled. An alternative approach, and you don't see this much in ecology, is you, uh, you create a forest plot of the outcomes at an individual study level. This makes sense if you have like uh, many studies, right? What you're doing is like pull, taking the grand mean at the study level. And I did it with this uh, meta-analysis just because I had few studies. to report so I thought it was let be like a easy thing to describe where um, right so the I just report the average uh, random effects grand mean at the study level so people could see all oh, the overall contributions of individual publications this is more like a medical research practice to do this thing at this level um, you don't see this often in ecology. We're not, often we have like hundreds of studies, so this graph would not make any sense. But what, what is the conclusion you want to draw from this, right? And typically in ecology, we're not like talking about the outcomes of individual studies. That's not an interesting thing. Um, but that might be something you do if you have a more applied focus in your synthesis and people are interested in, um, how studies relate to one another in the outcome uh, response reported. Um, in the um, in this paragraph too, you would you should try to squeeze in your uh, publication bias tests and funnel plot. Okay, so you do your Edgar's test, you, you report the statistic, you report the number of effects included in, in that, and you report your funnel plot. Typically, this stuff gets dumped in the appendix, right? You, for some reason, a journal has figure limitations, you're only allowed three figures. Um, this is not stuff that is, should take up a lot of space in your manuscript, in your uh, paper because they are kind of like um, quality outcomes, right? They, you're trying to convince your reader that your study is good. These are the thing, things that um, make the case, um, but they really don't uh, contribute to conceptually what you want to get across with the paper, in this case with the catnip repellency stuff. But I'm going, to, I'm going to try to squeeze in all this stuff in a single paragraph, have it all nicely encapsulated, just to make it easy for the reader to just put it on the radar right away, or to refer back to, oh, okay, we got just one section here that describes all the issues. And then the last part I like to squeeze in is um, methodological problems. And so for example, in my case, um, a potential source of bias was me converting the odds ratios into hedges DFX sizes. There was this, the smell in my data set, the stink that that, um, it was not, that there was some funny business going on in doing that. Not necessarily because the conversions are wrong or the conversions conversions are introducing bias, but somehow the um, certain studies are reporting one response me measure, whereas other studies are, are reporting another response measure, measure. So all the studies in which I extracted odds ratios were the ones showing kind of like the null outcome responses. 
And then all the studies reporting uh, positive effects of catnip as a repellent were the ones reporting summary statistics useful to calculate hedges D. I'll squeeze that in here, including the between study contrast uh, QB test, um, just because I want to get this out as quickly as possible so I could get to the nice meat of the studies. All right, so that's the first paragraph, right? Which uh, nicely encapsulates all sorts of issues with the composition of my synthesis. Then we jump into the meat of the results. And for me, yeah, I'm just going to set these up as questions. Is, wait, uh, does catnip repel mosquitoes? This is uh, something I did not analyze yet. I, in fact, uh, dropped all the effect sizes associated with this, but in the manuscript, I'm going to include all that stuff. I just, I just couldn't do all these analyses for you guys on video. Does catnip repel mosquitoes? So this is a effect sizes based on a, like a negative control, no catnip, no DEET just a solvent versus catnip, right? So the magnitudes of this are going to be huge because basically you're comparing nothing versus something. So I'll have a whole paragraph committed to reporting the stats associated with that. So the stats that you're going to use, at least in my case, are going to be fairly straightforward. They're going to include... Um, pooled effects, you know, the grand mean, just flat out asking the question, does catnip repel mosquitoes, right? You do a random effects average across all effects. Um, assess um, predictors. which would be the mosquitoes experimental design stuff. Okay, so this, this, this subheading would probably have maybe two or three paragraphs. One paragraph describing just like the overall effects of catnip. A second paragraph testing whether or not experimental design moderates those effects. And a third paragraph describing the ver uh, variabil variability amongst mosquito species, All right? The goal, again, is to provide information on for, to the reader that catnip is very inconsistent. And so that's a point I think I, I'm going to make over and over again. All the evidence points towards that. And so I'm going to emphasize that um, Synth synthesis level outcome over and over again. Another subheading I'm going to have is uh, repel as good as DEET. Right? <laughs> That's not a really uh, eloquent way to describe the subheading, but it's basically you know, like all the stuff I did with the course with the previous lectures is, you know, I wanted to address the, is catnip 10 times more effective than DEET? This is where this is the test for that stuff. Answer is overall, if you aggregate the outcomes, there's no difference between DEET and catnip. However, if you start looking at it in more detail, cutting things up by experiment, experimental design, cutting things up by, um, Species, it's inconsistent. I mean, and so there's no, you can't walk away with strong conclusions with the efficacy of catnip because the outcomes are all over the place. And so all the same stuff here gets that. This is essentially the structure of um, my results. Okay, 
In terms of reporting stuff, explicit, I will include a forest plot. These things, right, amongst the different categorical groups. So here I have one amongst different uh, species of mosquitoes. There's going to be one for that with just the question, does catnip repel? And then there's going to be another one, does catnip um, perform as well as DEET? And then it'll include sub, other subgroup analyses like experimental design and other important predictors. In terms of like generating forest plots, this, these are generated from ggplot. Um, it's fairly straightforward. There's a ton of resources out there. Spend some time to investigate what's already been done. There's a lot of neat R packages that allow you to do this. There's Excel tutorials if you wanted to do this in Excel. I don't know why you would want to do it in Excel, but whatever, you, whatever tools you're uh, most comfortable with before trying to reinvent the wheel. I mean, at this stage, there's so many things available for you to plot a forest plot that um, if you, you would save yourself a lot of time just by looking things up first before trying to model this and say ggplot by yourself. Things I like to pair report with the grand mean, the pooled averages, right? You got, of course, the mean, the grand mean, the pooled effect size within groups and their associated confidence intervals. That's fairly standard to report. Um, I like to report the QB test uh, or the QM test, the uh, omnibus test testing whether or not um, these groups differ. It's an omnibus test. It will be significant if at least one of these pairwise contrasts differ from one another. Um, and then, of course, bonus points. If you report the actual uh, variance estimates for the random effects, random factors you included in your meta-analysis, so like the between study variance component, the tau squared, report that. If you modeled other aspects of non-independence in your data set, report those too. I mean, they don't really take up that much space. And in the end, they provide information to the reader, right? If your tau squared is like eight, a variance of eight, that that is a red flag, meaning that there's you know you're not really doing a weighted analysis anymore. Everything's kind of been um, weighted all at the same level because the between study variance component is so big. I mean that's what happens when the tau squared is super big is the model essentially converges on a um, a regular average. It's no longer a weighted a weighted synthesis anymore. And so if you and so it's just good practice for you to just understand how to interpret the tau squared. And it's great for the reader, again, to uh, visually see, give them the opportunity to assess uh, the quality of your synthesis. Um, other plots, you know, I'm going to uh, include some meta regression plots here, which is just like a, it just looks like a regression, right? You got your effect sizes and a predictor, a continuous predictor. Um, Metaphor provides some nice ways to uh, calculate the uh, predicted line and confidence intervals with that kind of stuff. And so those tutorials are out there. Again, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. You know, do, do spend some time investigating how to plot these things, and you'll find that there's a ton of resources already done coded for you to get this stuff out. Um, other things to report, I think it's good for now. I mean, like I'm not going into like the explicit uh, stats that you need to report. Um, things you should always kind of have is, um, if you report a pooled effect, right, that's not in a figure, you report the average. You report its upper and lower confidence intervals, 95% conf confidence intervals, and you report the number of, fe of effects. of that pooled outcome, right? In, in meta-analysis jargon, 
That's called K. K is the number of, of effect sizes. Just to differentiate it from N, which is a typical uh, variable name that we use for sample size. So K is the sample size for meta-analysis. N is the sample size included within studies. So for example, okay, I will have a statement saying um, catnip repels mosquitoes. Um, pooled D equals 0 0.5 uh, comma uh, lower confidence intervals, upper con confidence intervals, and then K equals 200 effect sizes. Bonus points, if you want, report the tau squared in your random effects meta-analysis. I mean, no one's no one's gonna say, hey, drop all that stuff out. You're just, uh, you're you're going the step further than what what is normally reported. And I, I totally give you bonus points if you do that kind of stuff. Not that I'm grading your, <laughs> your syntheses, uh, but uh, I think you guys get the idea. Um, once I actually pull the manuscript together, I'm going to actually discuss all these sections over again um, just to show you guys exactly what I did. I got nothing right now. I need to really need to start working on this. But on your end, um, I think I hit on some of the important points in terms of uh, reporting results. My favorite is just including that um, composition uh, description at the start. You sandwich in all the publication bias. You sandwich in all the um, methodological compounds. You know, things that aren't totally interesting conceptually, but um, are useful to interpret the overall effects, especially if they do uh, moderate the, the, um, the effect sizes. If they do to moderate the effect sizes, that means downstream you need to always include it as a predictor in your model. Otherwise, you are just overlooking an important source of variability, um, which diminishes the claims you can make with your overall pooled effects that are associated with the conceptual topic you want to synthesize. <sighs> All right. And so uh, thanks for hanging out. Uh, I still have a ton of work to do. With this stuff, um, I got a, I got an email from a colleague saying, Mark, what are you doing with this class? Nobody wants to watch this stuff. It's too long. You talk too much. And, and I agree. <laughs> I agree. That was some poor, poor uh, foresight. Is that a word? I don't know. Poor, uh, a poor way for me to kind of begin this this whole endeavor without thinking through exactly what I'm going to talk about. My goal was just to give you guys something different than the conventional rote synthesis course. Uh, anyway, many regrets, many regrets. Um, okay, I'll leave it at that. Um, next lecture, we're going to talk about the discussion. And that should be fairly sh short also. And then I think I'm going to pause the series because I need to pull together the manuscript. And once I do that, then I'll kickstart it again and finally end with the submission of the manuscript. So much work ahead of me. Uh, thanks again. Right on. Take it easy.